Hello, my beautiful people. My name is Oso Katel. Welcome to another episode of Basic Nigerian History. Now, last episode, we discussed the transition of democratic rule after the death of Abacha and how Obasanjo inherited a country with multiple problems. We also saw how almost immediately after he became president, another issue of ethnic and religious conflict started wearing its ugly head. This episode, we're going to continue with Obasanjo's regime and see what it does to address these issues. In October 2001, Obasanjo announced the National Security Commission to address the growing communal violence that was occurring. He had to deal with Nigeria's heavy reliance on petrol and the ethnic and religious tensions. The next year, in 2002, there were violent protests in Kaduna over the Miss World B2 pageants that was supposed to take place in Abuja. It had been relocated to London. About 200 people were killed. This illustrated the Northerners' frustration of the perceived alliance between the government and the Western world. In 2006, religious protests in the North against the Prophet's cartoons turned violent and showed just how much the religious tension is linked to events elsewhere in the world. Dozens died in the riots. Violent conflicts between Christians and Muslims continued. But Obasanjo didn't really care about that. In fact, it seemed he was more concerned about Nigeria's image and reputation on the international stage than actually improving the country. His priority was trying to stop the steep decline of the economy. He planned to do this by focusing on courting foreign investments, reducing Nigeria's external debt, and continuing privatization of Nigerian businesses and industry. In 2001, Obasanjo worked with Senegal's Abdullahi Wade and South Africa's Thabo Mbeki to found NEPAD, New Partnership for Africa Development. The goal was to make African countries take a proactive role in promoting democracy and human rights and ostracizing governments that don't meet the democracy and human rights standard set by NEPAD. They hoped this would attract further investors to the region and lead to more stable and effective governance all over Africa. By the way, Obasanjo himself eventually came under criticism for not living up to his own words. Flawed elections, Nigeria living in abject poverty, but more on that later. Some of the successes of this was in 2003, where Nigeria was responsible for negotiating Charles Taylor abdication in Liberia after rebel forces threatened to start another civil war. And in 2005, when Nigeria persuaded ECOWAS to refuse the flawed elections in Togo, threatening economic sanctions unless new elections were held. However, Obasanjo himself had previously defied an international court ruling, declaring Nigeria had to surrender the Bakasi Peninsula to Cameroon to settle a long-standing water dispute back in 2002. So, he eventually agreed to hand it over in 2006. By 2005, Nigeria's influence in international religious affairs also appeared to be on the rise. Nigerian Cardinal Francis Arinze was considered one of the leading candidates for papacy after the death of Pope John Paul II. And in 2006, 21 congregations broke away from the Episcopal Church over its tolerance of homosexuality and joined Nigerian Bishop Peter Akintola's ultra-conservative Anglican Church. Nollywood also played an important factor in influencing Nigeria's international image, producing over 2,000 low-budget films each year. It was more productive than Hollywood or Bollywood. Nollywood has been widely popular all over Africa and has served as an avenue through which Nigeria culture could be expressed to the outside world. Even though it's consumed worldwide, the main target of the audience is usually Nigerians themselves. In 2003, Obasanjo was re-elected again under controversial circumstances, but his plan to gain foreign investments seemed to be working. In 2005, the FDI, the Foreign Direct Investment, grew from 1.1 billion in 2000 to 1.9 billion, and the GDP growth rose from 2.9% to 4.9% and remained at over 5% until 2006. This is all good news for Nigeria's economy. However, only a few Nigerians living in urban areas benefited from this. Most Nigerians didn't see any improvements to their life. There were also major problems with the oil industry, apart from the obvious, which was that Nigeria was unwisely heavily reliant on it, even though it was still bringing in plenty of money for the government, the oil industry was seriously messing up the environment. Niger Delta groups that were fighting for their rights began drilling into the oil pipelines and this led to multiple explosions and deaths. For example, in October 1998, in Jesse Town, 1,100 people died. In July 2000, again in Jesse Town, there were 215 deaths. In September 2004, near Lagos, 
there were about 60 deaths. In May 2006, in Ilado, there were approximately 150 to 200. Most popular of these anti-oil groups is MEND, Movement for the Emancipation of Niger Delta. But in general, they all attack oil installations and kidnap expatriates, use ransom money to buy better weapons so they can launch even bigger attacks. In 2006, the oil sector shrank noticeably, mainly because of the violence and instability in the Niger Delta, and the non-oil sector grew at a rate of 8.9%. Oil exports also shrank in the same year by an estimated 20%. By 2005, the annual per capita for the average Nigerian grew from $280 in 2000 to 560. But once again, it just padded the pockets of those who were already financially secure. Wealthy districts became a single for corruption of the elite class. Abuja was deliberately made so expensive that the government made it illegal to build your own house in the area just to keep it pristine in the eyes of the big wigs and the foreign dignitaries. So civil servants that worked in the nice air-conditioned offices of Abuja would need to travel in from their home in the shanty villages on the outskirts of the city. From 2001, they had also been a rapid expansion of the telecommunication industry. In 2002, there were about 350,000 mobile phone users in Nigeria, but by 2006, the number of mobile phone users had reached 28 million, and it continued to grow at a 30% rate. Those who did not own a mobile phone could easily access phones at small booths in neighborhood urban areas. Internet cafes popped up all over the place, allowing the average Nigerian to access the internet for a price. This growth of economy allowed Obasanjo to pay off the country's foreign debt. He struck a deal with the Paris Club, which was a group of mainly European wealthy countries that owned $30 billion of Nigerians' foreign debt. The deal was that Nigeria would pay off $12.4 billion of the loan in exchange for the cancellation of the remaining debt. The total debt was then reduced to $5 billion owed to the World Bank and other creditors. This was a good achievement. Obasanjo was succeeding in reducing the country's external debt and attracting foreign investments like he planned. However, the actual internal issues of the country were largely ignored. The infrastructure still sucked. Civil servants, teachers, university lecturers still went without pay for months. This caused many strikes and school closures. Public services all still sucked. Electricity was rarely there. There was no pipe born water except when done privately. The large brain drain, intelligent and talented Nigerians leaving the country continued. Nigerian health personnel were attracted to better paying jobs in Europe or USA. The education system was just rubbish. Transportation was incredibly inefficient. We already know how bad traffic can get. Health service was still so rubbish that the politicians responsible for improving it regularly flew out of the country for their health needs. Can you imagine that rubbish? Yadua and Vice President Atiku Abubakar flew out of the country for medical attention in March of 2007. And we all know that the current president, Buhari, did something similar recently. Malaria remained prevalent and outbreaks of other viruses like cholera, meningitis, and yellow fever were common. And although it wasn't as bad as other sub-Saharan African countries, HIV was on the rise. And most of all, corruption did not stop. At first, people were happy that others were being impeached by EFCC, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission for Corruption. But this quickly became a tool for politicians to use against their enemies. An example of the powers of EFCC being used well was in 2005 with Diaspora Ale Messia. Wow, what a name. Anyway, let's call him DSP for short. This man was the governor of Bailesa State and he was caught with 1.8 million pounds of stolen funds in London. He fled London in disguise and returned to Nigeria where he was promptly impeached and arrested. But by 2007, Obasanjo was being accused by the public of using EFCC against his vice president article. We'll get into why in the next episode, don't worry about that. Basically, in everyday life and everyday society, corruption had become a normal aspect of life, like you literally couldn't live without taking part in the corruption. From paying policemen at highway checkpoints to bribing officials just to get legitimate documents that should be yours anyways, it was rampant. Elaborate fraud schemes, known as 419, became very common, with the main goal being cheating Nigerians and foreigners out of millions of dollars. Side note, 419 was named after the legal code number under which those fraud cases 
are prosecuted. And that's the end of this episode. We're going to leave it there for now. Next episode, we're going to continue talking about on passengers' reign and how it proceeded. Guys, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment below, hit the notification button, tell your friends. Also, we are launching our own independent new edutainment streaming service. It's called Africa Story. Go over there and check it out. If you subscribe, you're supporting us and helping all of us to tell our own story. Thank you very much. Shotgun, tell out.